I'm mostly going to give you guys a nuts and bolts talk about how to actually do RNA-seq differential analysis today. Normally, I give science talks that's more about, you know, hand wavy, like this is what we do, this is what it's for, this is the biology, you know, question that we're after. Today, it's just going to be how do you actually do it, right? Um, so. Uh, I thought I'd first tell you about a little bit about my lab so you sort of get an idea. Um, like she said, I run the Bioinformatics Shared Resource. This is kind of a core facility where we do analysis for hire. We also do training in informatics analysis. We're really trying to get the students and postdocs to learn how to do this on their own so that that can be one of the skills they go off with because that's going to be really useful to them and it's kind of almost necessary these days. Right? Um, so there are three people in the group that do that, Ying, Yuan, and Eric. Um, I think you're going to meet yes. Ying later today. Uh, I also have a lab um, where we do integrative genomics out analysis. So we combine, you know, whole genome sequencing to look for SNPs and copy number variants. We combine that with RNA-seq data to see how that affects expression level. We'll combine it with other stuff like small RNA sequencing to look for post-transcriptional effects on expression, things like that. And in general, I'm usually working on, you know, a few particular contexts in which that tends to be really important, which we think we can really go after those questions. Um, but I'm not going to tell you anything about that today, any more about it really, um, because instead I'm going to tell you about how to actually do uh, gene expression analysis using the Tuxedo Suite and, and RNA-seq data. Because I've heard that you guys just got your RNA-seq data back and you're going to be working on actually doing uh, the mapping, the abundance, and the stats later on. Okay, um, so uh, we will start off, I'm going to start off get, giving you guys a good reference paper, right, because this is going to be really helpful. They actually go through nuts and bolts too, like they'll list command lines and, yes, that was their homework. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah? <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. You know about it. That's excellent. Okay, then I don't have to tell you. Um, okay, so then the, the other thing that I always harp on is that some people talk about why RNA-seq might be better than microarrays, and there are a lot of people who are really frustrated with the, uh, you know, quirks and, 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 uh, effort that goes into RNA-seq data analysis and they want to go back to microarrays. So we kind of have to remind ourselves like why we switched and what they're good for. So the great thing about microarray micro uh, for expression analysis is that the, the analysis tools are well established, the files are small and easy to work with, the protocols to make the libraries are really easy and that's what people really love about them. Um, but there are problems, right? You can't see um, you, uh, anything novel, right? You're not going to find any novel transcripts, you're not going to find antisense transcripts that people weren't expecting or pervasive transcription across the genome. You know, you're not going to find novel splice isoforms, right? You couldn't just take a organism whose genome hasn't been sequenced and try and figure it out from the RNA-seq data, right? There's all sorts of things you can do with RNA-seq that you can't do with microarrays. And the other problem is that there's a small dynamic range, right? There's a certain amount of intensity that you can measure, and the really abundant genes are going to saturate long before you'll see the sort of lowly expressed things that you might particularly be interested in, right? So for all those reasons, RNA-seq is going to be the way that we're going to do expression analysis until something com better comes along, right? So people are talking about, you know, single molecule direct RNA sequencing, which might replace the kind of, you know, uh, uh, Illumina type sequencing, short read sequencing that we're doing right now. But for right now, this is the best we've got. And it's actually, considering how far we've come in five years, kind of amazing um, what we can do with this stuff, right? Okay, so how do you actually do it? Um, I heard that you guys had a great talk about, you know, QC on the reads, right? Um, and a little bit about mapping, but that maybe a little bit more on the mapping would be great. So I'm going to go really quickly through the QC. Um, I'm sure he told you about this, but when you're looking at a fast QC report, it's really common to fail, right? So that's, that's the one thing that most people need to be reassured about when they're looking at their our fast QC report, is that failing a few things is okay. Um, you just have to look at them to see if it's important, right? Okay, the most, um, it used to be really common to fail on the sequence quality, right? So let me see, I think red, ah. Okay, so down here, it used to be really common that, the, that it would come down into the red near the end of the reads, and that was maybe even three years ago, that was really common. It's much less common now, especially in the longer reads, right? And as long as you've got about 30 to 50 nucleotides of good sequence, it really doesn't matter anymore if you fail that one a little bit. And most of the time, you'll get very nice ones that look like this. Right, because sequencers have gotten a lot better and the kits have gotten a lot better. Um, the other really common place to fail um, is that you'll get primer dimers, right? Uh, adapter sequences that are pretty much all the adapter in the read. Um, this is much more common in short read sequencing when you're doing like 50 base pair runs and you're ligating on small things. Uh, I think you guys did paired in 300 or something like that. So you probably won't see this. Maybe at the very end, you know, you'll read through the fragment into the adapters or something like that. But most likely you probably won't. But we, but 
adapted trimming for us as part of. She is. Yeah. Nice. So Excellent. Yeah, so that's a, you know, there's a there's something called the FastX Clipper. Um, it's basically a yeah. software toolkit that was written by uh, Gordy. He used to be here. He's moved on since yeah. to uh, MIT. Um, but he wrote a whole suite of software tools for doing things just like that, clipping off the adapters off the three, uh, three prime end, right? Um, okay, I'm now going to skip a whole bunch of stuff because I figured that he covered the rest of that, the, you know, all the details of FastQC reports. I'm going to skip over the part about building the genomes because I assume that it's either been done for you or explained and all that. Um, and I'm going to skip over the theory of how hash tables and the burrows wheeler transform, like the theory of how aligners work, right? Because I figure, even though it's kind of cool, right, the idea of how you actually align the sequences, I'm just going to go through, you know, the parameters you actually need to specify when you're using the tools instead of the theory of how they work, okay? Um, but tell me if you, if you disagree with that. Um, mapping with Top Hat, um, Top Hat is an RNA-seq specific aligner, which makes it slightly different from your average aligner. Your average aligner just aligns to the genome. Um, what Top Hat does is it collects all of those initially unmappable reads, some subset of which will be because they cross splice junctions, right? And then tries to uh, figure out how many of those can be explained by splice, splice junctions uh, in your transcripts. And you can either do that by learning those splice junctions de novo, by figuring out lots and lots of reads that pile up between two exons, right? Uh, or you can just feed it a list of known splice junctions and it will do it from that. In general, you need really, really deep data to be able to do a really good job of finding novel isoforms and novel splice junctions. So most of the time, people just use the known ref-seq set of uh, exon intron structures in the genome. Can you just like, slow down the yeah. Ref-seq set? Ref-seq. Uh, so there, when you go to a list of annotations for the genome, there's several different sets and they're you know, made by several different people. Right? And they differ in the level of how much manual curation and how much evidence there is for that particular uh, uh, gene an uh, structure annotation. Right? So RefSeq is the um, highest confidence uh, set that has both um, multiple sources of data as well as um, a, a lot of manual curation of the transcripts that went into it. So for the newer, more novel things that were discovered usually by computational algorithms, those will be in different sets, like the ensemble annotations, for instance. It's a much longer list, lots of which is garbage, lots of which is real novel stuff that's just not in RefSeq. Um, but RefSeq is the one that, ha that is very high confidence. It does include long non-coding RNAs and other things that some people consider to be novel and interesting and new, um, but not a lot of them, right? So it doesn't have the full list of link RNAs that, like, for instance, the labs that study these uh, have listed. Yeah. At what point can I modify the bow tie routine or data set mm -hmm. in order to make the plant consistent? So, um, there are sets of parameters that you can use to determine what you think the uh, average intron length should be. Right? So that's one of the things that commonly differs. Um, there are routines that you can use to accept what we would consider cryptic splice sites. Right? Um, that's another thing that might differ um, between different organisms. Um, in general, uh, you, you just have to do it in a couple different iterations. Right? So you'll align first. Right? You'll align to the genome first, um, allowing it to de describe its own novel uh, 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 trans uh, splice junctions. And then you will try to assemble the transcripts. And I'm, I'm going to get to that. That's a second program called Cufflinks. Right? And then what you'll get is you'll get a list of uh, predicted um, exon intron structures that Cufflinks will make for you. And then usually what you do is you go back and align to that. And then you just iterate until you get something that you feel is high confidence, like it doesn't keep changing every time that you go through this, right? So if you're going to do uh, novel transcript uh, predictions, it's generally this sort of iterative process. Um, I, I recommend only doing this if you have at least 100 million reads um, because you need a lot of data in order to do a really good job of this. And the reason is you need lots and lots of reads that cross the splice junction that are anchored on each end in order to do a good job, right? Um, and otherwise, what you'll get is lots and lots of called novel transcripts that are really just one or two exons. Um, because those were the only ones where you had a good um, uh, splice junction crossing read in order to define that that's a transcript. 
right? So I've done this before. So for instance, like the lizard, uh, Nolis carolensis or something like that, right? Um, and we had reasonably deep data. We had like 60 million reads or something like that. And I think we ended up predicting um, 150,000 transcripts or something like that, 30% um, of which overlapped with known uh, conserved vertebrate transcript structures. Um, so probably we were calling a lot of stuff that was really just fragments of true transcripts, um, but, uh, but it's doable. So what kind of confidence level do you, I mean, how mathematically do you say, I mean, how many reads would you look at to say that I believe this really is a novel transcript or a novel isoform as opposed yeah. to I just got, you know, whatever, a book on the screen? So we can, I'm, I'm going to skip. So uh, that, this is partially why we only chose to do differential expression for this first yeah. year, uh -huh. because that's a lot more. <clears throat> you need a lot more data, and it's a little. It's a lot more difficult actually to analyze. Than yeah, yeah, yeah. So we could do a whole course just on how to call novel transcripts, okay. right? Um, okay. Definitely. But I wanted to give you this, right? So this is what it really looks like. This is one gene. This is AKT. Um, I had for this run, I think, 80 million reads, right? So this is one single RNA-seq sample. Um, each of these little things here, this is the actual exon intron structure for uh, AKT. Um, there are actually multiple isoforms in here, but uh, it, essentially only this one was being expressed, so I'm just showing you this one, okay? Um, each of these little red and blue lines, those are reads pointing in either this direction or that. This was a paired end run, so all of the ones pointing in this direction are the ones that are in the sense, all the ones pointing in that direction are anti-sense, and they're color-coded for which when they are. Um, and all of the blue lines are splice crossing reads, right? This was a particularly abundant transcript. So for this one, I got tons and tons and tons of splice crossing reads that enabled me to, I could probably actually, you know, put this whole transcript back together just from these reads. And so if you have an abundant transcript, if you have lots of splice crossing reads like this, if you have long reads, which give you a better chance of actually crossing those, right, you can probably do a pretty good job. Um, this is rare. This will be 40% or less um, of the transcripts that you're going to see in a given run, right? Um, so for the abundant ones, you'll do a really great job. For the less abundant ones, eh. Um, in general, your reads will still map, right? It's just a question of whether or not you can reconstruct the transcript uh, correctly. Okay, so we're going to go back uh, to the mapping one. Um, so, okay, so this is the way that Top Hat does it just at the mapping stage. So this Can is I not... Can one more question about the Yeah, record? sure. So if you're working with something like human or mouse... Yeah. How is the reference genome updated so frequently that by the time you finished your analysis you have to redo it again? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, in general, people are still working with um, HG19. There's actually a new genome uh, that's come out since then. Um, the human and the mouse genomes are, s there are still places where there are mis mistakes and there are still places where we have not assembled the genome well. That's why there's that chromosome unknown for all of the stuff that we can't put together with the rest well, of it. I'm thinking particularly of our PAC biotech and, the, yeah. and all of those splice variants that are being discovered yeah. that we didn't know about. Yeah. In general, they're the more lowly abundant ones. Sometimes that's interesting. That doesn't mean they're not interesting, right? In general, for the abundant genes, and when I say abundant, I mean one RPKM, which people have figured out, is roughly one transcript per cell. So for the, everything that's at least present at about one transcript per cell in one of the major tissues that's been sequenced, we, we know it fairly well, right? Uh, for coding genes, not for non-coding genes, but for coding genes. Right? It's a, it's a lot harder for non-coding transcripts um, and for antisense transcripts and all this cool new stuff that we're finding out. But in general, those don't go into the genome annotation things anyway, right? Um, so for if you're working, not yet, but they should. <laughs> but if you're working with human and mouse genomes um, and you have a particular GTF file which describes your intron and extron st um, structures and you have a particular copy of the genome, you will be good for that, right, for a couple years. Yes, exactly. Like if you're interested. Yeah. Yeah. By the time you finish your honeybee analysis, it'll be in the Well, honeybee should be okay. Yeah. Not for a lot of they don't curate it that often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that many people doing it, but your your conversion of one RPKM, about one mRNA per cell, is that for humans or is that it was done wild? for yeah, exactly. So it was figured out for a couple of different situations where they were able to sort the number of cells that went in. They mm -hmm. used bike and controls and they were able to figure out about what it meant. So, you know, it's it's per million reads mapped, right? And it's not completely right, right, right. linear, right? right? 
um, and it's also per kilobase of exon, effect, uh, mappable exon, right? So it's for, it was done for transcripts that are on average about 2 kb, right? So an average transcript reasonably expressed at about 2 kb, 1, RPK, 1 to 2 rpkm will be about one transcript per cell. And it's just what, you know, it's what set our minimum bar for what we call an express transcript. But people will move all over 1, 5, 10. Okay, because I was told before that you just take the median of your, because um, people are, are clever as they just said, just yeah. the median of that, just, you know, Excel file median of that divided by 4. And then yeah. that as the minimum express gene. And, I mean, and those values end up being about 0.3 RPK. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends, so right? That, well, so there's a lot of different ways of, of doing transcript normalization. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop and because we're gonna go there. Okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So um, okay. So we have we have our mapped reads. When you're doing a typical top hat run, when you're actually mapping the reads, looks like this. The most important things you need to specify are the reads files, one for each paired end, the genome index file, um, which you've built with Bowtie Build, the transcripts files, which have those exon intron structures, um, the insert size, what you expect the distances between the two reads. I'll explain that better in a second, um, and the library type, whether this was stranded or not, an Illumina library or not. And there's a reason that that's important, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, okay, so when you build your genome, you get a set of genome index files. There's usually six of them. What you actually specify on the command line, though, is just the prefix that references what they're, how they're named. So for instance, I call this one HG19, and that refers to this whole set of six files here, which is what your genome index file actually looks like. It's basically a hash table lookup file of where all the kmers are in the genome so it can go find them and then map the read really quickly. Um, okay, um, the GTF file, Top Hat is extremely picky about the format of this file. Um, fortunately, they've picked one for you that they know plays nicely with Top Hat, but you can't just get a random one or you know, resort it and reformat it yourself and expect it to work with Top Hat. So there's a groomer that they've written to make sure it will work. Um, if you download it from the Top Hat website, um, you know it will work. Otherwise, you come to somebody like me to get help um, or use their groomer. Um, uh, okay, insert size. So this is the expected distance between the reads themselves, right? So for instance, if you cut out a uh, 500 base pair fragment and you did a paired end 101 run, right? Then you take 500 minus the two reads themselves and your insert size, the expected distance between the reads themselves is about 300. Okay, for you guys, you did a paired end 300 run. I'm guessing your fragment size is something that is less than 600 or something like that. Your insert size is zero. Okay, you expect no difference. You don't usually use negative numbers to imply overlap. So why is this important? This is, this is important for mapping qualities because Top Hat decides whether or not it good, did a good job mapping based on whether or not the two ends map and the insert size between them is something near the expected insert size. Right? That way, if they're really far apart or if they're on different chromosomes, it gets a much worse mapping score. Um, but we, we're, some of us have small genomes, so it is yeah. like 75 base pairs. Yeah. So, and so we would, if we would then we'd have it to be 75 to 75. Yeah. So we'd have our insert size would be yeah. closer to whatever. Yeah, exactly. But we, we do have the same library prep sizes for both. What's the library prep size? From the bio No, I mean that we. Oh, yeah, between 250 and 450. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you would probably pick like 300 and what, or something. I ask you a question because yep. Vic and I have go, gone back and forth between about this. So, fragment size actually yep. includes the sequencing parameters. Oh, does it actually include yeah, the sequencing? That's what we call fragment. Yeah, 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 but that's on your. Insert. Yeah. Okay. So, you have 500. Yeah. And, so, and then you have the insert size being 298. Yeah. But that's, we have to subtract the adapters off the end, the sequencing adapters off the ends too. Then. Don't, aren't those already ligated when you do the bioanalyzer? So if you take yeah. the size from the bioanalyzer, that has the sequencing adapters on them. So that's that size. That's the fragment size. So it's not the, you know, the, when you f literally fragment the RNA, which is one of the first steps in the yeah. library prep, it's not that size. Right. It's the bioanalyzer that's size. What you're about. Yeah. And then you're asking, but now, now I'm asking the insert size to distinguish from the fragment size. Yeah. The insert size, I usually consider minus the adapter. It's minus the adapter minus, um, uh, and the read, right? Because, well, this, that's not a, is this a marker? Yeah, it should be. Uh, oh, that's for the smart No, that's for the smart board. Yeah. Here, orange, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. 
So you have a bioanalyzer, and the trace looks like this, and this is usually something like 250, you know, depending yes, on what you did or something yeah. like that, okay. right? Yeah. Okay, and then, so you have the fragment that gets sequenced on the flow cell, right? And this includes the adapters, right, that you, as you, as you put them on, right? And then the reads themselves, right? So um, in general, when we're doing a paired end 101 run, right, it's 100 from this side, right, that you sequence, it's 100 from this side that you sequence, and the insert size is this, right? Yeah, so if this whole thing is something like 500, this thing should be something like 300, right? Um, and usually you can, also, um, you can also figure this out. You can map first and then look. There'll be one single um, column of the SAM file that is the distance between where the two rat reads mapped, and you can get it from that and redo it if you were wrong. Right. This is an example, right? So I don't know what yours were because I wasn't part of yours. Okay, this, is just, okay. <laughs> this is just an example of how you do the calculation. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, he is 75. You, yeah, exactly. There were two different runs over this group. One was 150 paired N, one was 75 paired N. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I got it. And I forget which group you were in, I'm sorry. I think the same. Okay, great, all right. All right, um, okay, library type. This one actually, the first time you do this is really annoying to figure out because it's not intuitive at all um, and there's not often a lot of help to figure out which one it should be. Um, usually most of the, la um, in general, most kits are usually first strand. What that means is it's a stranded Illumina kit. And I assume your libraries were stranded Illumina libraries. Yeah, so your libra library type is FR first strand. What that means is that the first strand that was sequenced is the complementary one to the, to the actual uh, uh, RNA itself, right? So all your reads are gonna be the reverse complement of the transcriptome, right? Okay, the first read. The second one will be um, the sense read, okay? Um, there are two other options. There's unstranded, that used to be really common, it's much less common now. And then second strand, almost nobody uses this. This is for like solid sequencing um, and a couple other different methods, but it's, it's pretty rare for, for that to be your answer. And Muhammad set the default for you already as stranded, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay. So I have a question, if we wanted to, like say we want to go into SRA and analyze solid data, how do we change that? Well, you can. So it really depends on um, ex exactly how you care. So one way would just be to do unstranded and then to see where most of the first reads map. There's a flag in the SAM file that allows you to pull out just the first reads and you can see if those have a strand bias. If they don't, you were unstranded, <laughs> right, uh, in general. Um, you know, and you can just leave it at that if you want. You can even, if it was stranded, leave it like that. But you know, there are cases where when you're counting gene abundance, you might only want to count reads for the gene if they're actually sensed to the transcript itself, right? Um, so uh, so it do, it's up to you whether you think that's important um, or whether you wanna leave it like that. Um, there are a couple other options that people use um, that might change. Um, I, these are probably things that you've already set defaults for but allow people to change. One is the number of mismatches you're going to allow per read. In general, the default is two and it's up to you depending on the length of the read whether you wanna make that longer or not. Um, it, the number of alignments to per read to report, right? So you will get ma multi-mapper reads in there. You know, these are from paralogs. These are from embedded uh, repeat elements that are in often three prime UTRs of genes. Um, these are in link RNAs tend to be heavily repeat enriched. They have a lot of transposable elements and other sorts of uh, repeat sequences in them. Um, there's a difference between whether, how many of those you report and whether or not you suppress all hits that map many more times than that. Right? Because there are some people who are only interested in things that map uniquely to the genome because then they can be really sure about where it came from and they don't have this fuzziness about you know, trying to infer the best place. And that's up to you whether or not how repeat rich your genome is. For instance, in plants, they tend to be heavily repeat rich and we tend to allow more multi-mappers. Um, but at some point, we usually want to suppress all hits above a certain uh, maximum threshold in addition to um, setting whether, how many of those we want to report. Um, 
Uh, oh, uh, the other ones that are common, uh, one is no mixed. That means not to report an alignment if you can't both map both ends of the fragment. Um, whether or not you choose to use this or not depends on, for instance, if you're looking for fusion transcripts, indels, other sorts of things where you might expect one read to map and not the other. Um, and then the last one is no novel junctions, right? Some people are particularly interested in novel splice junctions. Some people think, I don't have the data for this. You know, I don't know if I want to include those. Don't return that. Just map it to the stuff that's known, and I'm just going to work with that, right? And then the last one is the number of threads to use. This, um, there's actually a difference between threads and, and processors. Um, I assume you're going to set that depending on how these runs run on the server. Um, but all this does is make it go faster because this is an incredibly parallel problem. Each read mapped independently of every other read, except, of course, for the paired end, right? And whether you map them all in order or whether you split them into 100 different files and map them all at the same time just means you'll go faster, right? But it doesn't affect the, um, the mapping itself, the results you get. You send it to one versus the CPU? Like you send it to one? I usually use 10. Per CPU? Uh, hmm? Oh, uh -huh. threads per CPU or something like that. Uh, I usually use four threads and 10 CPUs when I'm doing a top hat run if it's deep data. But I'm usually working with 80 million reads or something like that. If they're getting 40 million reads, it's probably fine. Set it to fewer or something. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. So with the second one down, it's G2 mapping on our lines. Yes. So if you're you know, basically if you're just exploring your data and you have a genome that you're pretty much sure has a lot of parallels, yep. you want to play with this. Right. You might, yeah. No, well, so, okay, so we've done this before where we were particularly interested in transpose on transcripts. And what we wanted to know is, you know, as I keep increasing this number, how many more alignments do I get per read? And when do I just saturate? And I'm just getting a huge file, but I'm not getting a larger percentage of my reads mapping. And for us, because we had a lot of transpose on transcripts in the files we were using, that number was 100. Right? So it turns out that at 100 alignments, more than that, and you don't get a larger fraction of them to read, you just get much bigger alignment files. Right? Um, in, for instance, the maze genome. Right? When we're working with that one, usually we set that number to something like 20. That will cover most of the known non-coding RNAs. That will cover most of the low copy repeats, but it won't cover like the high copy retro elements or something like that, right? uh, like LPRs or something. Um, uh, but it, it's one of those numbers that you kind of have to do trial and error with your genome to figure out where a good setting is for it. Okay. All right. Um, a typical output directory will have a ton of files, two of which are really important. Okay. Um, one is your actual uh, BAM file. That's the alignment. That's the main output. Um, of, of, a, of a given top hat run. Um, depending on whether or not you're interested in insertions and novel junctions, those things are kept in here. Um, the left kept reads and right kept reads, that's mostly for debugging. Don't really worry about those. Um, the logs files are nice because if you look in there, they will tell you exactly what parameters you use so that if you forget, right, and want to go back and remember exactly what settings you use for this run versus that run and why you got a different alignment number, you can go back into the logs files and actually read it and make sure you still have that info, okay? Um, the BAM file itself, you guys are not going to be able to see this. Did he go over what, what an what a alignment file looks like? He did, yeah, so we can skip this one? Okay, all right, so uh, basically a BAM file is a binary for, uh, form of a SAM alignment file. It just includes your reads, your maps, some quality information, and some more flags about how that read mapped, but I won't go over them in detail because it sounds like he did. And then I showed you one before. This is what happens when you load your BAM file in a viewer. This happens to be IGV. Um, the nice thing about IGV is that it does all this color coding for you. It does the putting the line between the splice crossing reads for you. Um, it does the coverage. So this, this little gray bar up here is the coverage for how many reads I got across that whole region. Um, and it gives you the structure of the gene itself. You can also load this in the UCSC genome browser, but it doesn't do all that nice color coding. It doesn't do the splice crossing reads kind of stuff, and it doesn't give you the coverage. All it's going to give you are the little blocks themselves piling up, right? So when most people think about viewing the reads, they don't actually mean the little blocks themselves piling up. Usually what they want to see is this coverage file, the spiky wiggle file output, right? Um, and you have to do a conversion from your BAM file to a wiggle file in order to get that when you want to see it in the UCSC genome browser. So we have, sorry. What's on that screen that you don't get in UCSC? 
Uh, this this little coverage thing at the top, you don't get this in UCSC. You'll just see the little blocks themselves. So these little red and blue dots that you see here, each of one of those is a read. And you'll just see a pile up of those little blocks um, over the locus if you're using the UCSC genome browser. And you won't get any of the color coding and you won't get the blue lines to show you reads that cross splice junctions. So there's a couple of things, right? To do this, you have to have the BAI file? Yes, yeah, so you have to index the genome with SAM tools, okay? Yeah. Um, and you also have to have IGV itself, right. which so, is a... Because I know you like systems that like you move in your, you guys like bring, I mean, are you supposed to download your BAM file and then move into IGV as long as you have the BAI file in the same, because I was having trouble doing this last night. And yeah. So I get my top down input, I mean output, I'm sorry, and I just download them onto my desktop to make it easier. Open up IGV yeah. on my desktop, move over the BAM and BAI file, and I, I didn't, I got the, I just got blocks, I didn't, I didn't get the quantitation. You didn't get the coverage files here. Oh, that advanced. You didn't get you didn't get this gray part here up at no, the top. This is gray bars without any. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, we didn't load it right. We'll, we'll work yeah. on that later. Though. Yeah. Definitely okay. work on that later. Okay. The other thing is, you know, I didn't. I, I don't know if I mentioned this. Many different genomes here. Yeah. Not everybody is in RGV. Oh, okay. So some people are going to be doing the UCSC or something yes. like that because there's UCSC. She said if I could be in a wiggle file. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe somebody can help us do that later. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a BAM to bed graph thing, and if they load bed graph um, uh, or big bed. Okay. We'll, we'll yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll work on that. Okay. Yeah. You can make your own IGV genomes. Oh, that's the other thing somebody asked. Right. Me. You can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You can do that. Okay. So you can load up the exon. What it needs is the exon intron structure and the and the genome index itself, right? So. Um, so you can add yeah, so you'll need a GTF file. You'll need a, something called a dot .genome file. These are all things that you can make, right? So, you know, for, so I did this for Maze, for instance, right? And I wanted to load up transcripts that we had defined and curated and things like that. You can, you can really customize this, so right? So can you tell us why it was the Maze third genome for that? For or which one? Oh, AGBV3? Yeah. No, my, we're still working with AGBV2. Yeah, but I noticed that everybody else, like maysequence.org, switched over to the next one, which is, it's hard for us, right? Because oh, yeah, it's, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, uh, so are you working with V3 or V2? Well, the V2, but also DNA Southway has the version 3, so now oh, it still has version 2, and so I'm yeah, going yeah, yeah. to redact all those versions really good. Yeah. There's this thing called genomaze.org. It's put out by Florida State University that still has a browser for V2 um, if you just want to load it up in there. But yeah, no, it's a hassle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if you go to the Broad website where it describes IGV, they'll tell you exactly what you need to do to create your own genome file so that you can use IGV too. IGV also. Uh, IGV oh, Integrated oh, Genomics Institute? Viewer. Right. It's at the Broad. Okay. Yeah. Broad yeah. Just Google IGV Broad. The, the yeah. The link is on the agenda page. Yeah. I like IGV. Um, okay. Um, so basically, you do this separately for each of your um, uh, replicates, right? So you'll get a different BAM file for each of the replicates. You'll index them if you want to to put them somewhere else. And then you're going to put them all together and you're going to go straight to CuffDiff, right? Okay, so there is a package called CuffLinks in the middle that I'm not explaining. You only do CuffLinks if you want to assemble novel transcripts, if you want to assemble your own transcripts, right? If you just want to do differential expression, you can go straight to CuffDiff. And it doesn't save you any time to go through cufflinks because cufdiff is going to redo all of the transcript abundance calculations anyway, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't give you anything extra. You only do that if you're interested in assembling the transcripts themselves, right? Which, which in general means novel transcripts from your reads, okay? So I'm going to skip that. Um, uh, um, why would you want to do this? We talked about that before. Maybe you don't have good transcript annotations. That's often true in plants. Maybe you want to find novel. Sorry. Yes. Yes. That's a are cufflink those, one. Are those the novel transcripts? Yes, exactly. And those are the ones you're referring to. Yeah, exactly. So I wouldn't even see those if I didn't skip. You, that's true. That's true, right? So if you, um, um, 
So the biggest problem for maize is that we have almost no isoform annotation, right? Um, we, have, we have, you know, generally one transcript per gene or something like that, right? Um, in addition, there are additional transcripts. It depends on whether or not you use the working gene set versus the filtered gene set um, as your set of, of, of uh, uh, as your GTF file, right? Um, so the working gene set contains many, many more things that are not in the filtered gene set. Um, and in general, it's usually okay to do the working gene set because it's pretty comprehensive. Um, but again, you can, you wouldn't see those x dot loc uh, transcripts without going through couplings because those are the ones that couplings called from your data. And um, if you have enough for the abundant ones, Oh, no, it's not a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So um, I don't want to discourage you from doing it because it's one of the things that RNA-seq is for, right? It's finding novel transcripts, right? Um, I, it's just that um, I think people expect to be able to get good transcript annotations from a single run. And in general, that's not been the case unless we had really deep data, right? So I would just take those transcripts that are called with a grain of salt in the sense that they tend to be fragments of known things or they tend to be, you know, um, other things that we just don't know how, how much confidence to have in. So you have in them. like multiple, like let's say, because we actually were getting 100 million reads from the yeah. data that yeah. Oh, that's so, fabulous. Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm just wondering, um, and we have like two replicates of each sample, like, yeah. if we see it in both, would, I, I'm just wondering whether we should just skip couplings because it's kind of in the yeah. subway and we have yeah. all this data, or, um, whether we need to go to IGD and check each one and see if we really believe it's there, or? So that's one of the problems, right? So you'll get 50 to 100,000 novel transcripts called, right. depending yeah. on Sorry. it, right? And the, and the problem dealing with that is whether or not you're gonna go through each one individually, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, you can, you can. <laughs> you have a you summer, know, you know? <laughs> 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 exactly. I mean, there are things, you, there are tricks you can do com computationally to try and retrieve things that are higher confidence. You can grab things for which the um, intron structure length is typically smaller than some length but larger than another, right? So it's more than a KB, but it's less than 100 KB or something like that. You can say what fraction of the novel transcripts have reads that cross the splice junction for the novel junction that's called, right? So if it's above some number relative to the number of reads that are on either side of it, because it should be about even, right, then you can use that as a trick to say, okay, I have confidence in this one, right? So there are these tricks you can play to try and pull out things that you believe in, but the problem is that you can't, you know, you just have to decide how, how much to narrow it down to before you're going to say, I believe that I'm willing to invest the time to go after right. these ones. Right. Okay. So let's say that some of these new transcripts mm -hmm. are splice variants of Known genes. Yep. Uh, would the uh, coupling information tell you which gene it's mapping to? Sort of. To to yeah. So there's this. So it has a separate routine from that. I think it's called cuff merge or something like that. What it tells you is it tells you all of the transcripts that overlap known things and what fraction it overlaps. Right. Um, so that way you can go out, you know, go through all of the things that you have and figure out how many of those are contained within or overlapping uh, known exon structures. But that would be one way to, to cut that number to at least something that maybe we want to look at. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Right. And often, you know, it might be antisense that it just cover the promoter or something like that. You can decide whether that's something you're particularly interested or not interested in. Right. So there, there, are, there are other ways you can, you can cut down the number. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, uh, cuff diff for DE. So, cuff diff itself, uh, separately from the cuff links, um, calculates the abundances. Um, in particular, it, it figures out of the different splice isoforms that cover what you're calling a gene locus, how many reads should be attributed to each one, right? And it figures this out by using the ones that map uniquely to each exon and then taking the ones that overlap and figuring out how to divvy up those reads based on how many map uniquely to an exon that's unique to that particular isoform, right? So this is one way of saying like if 80% of the reads um, of the whole locus map to a single unique isoform, um, uh, exon over here, right, and then there's a place where they overlap and more than that, many more than that number of reads map over there, right, that clearly belongs to a different isoform, but how many of the reads that overlap am I going to distribute between them? And it uses basically a maximum likelihood iteration cycle to figure that out, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, so you have, 
here's an example. You have three different splice isoforms, right? Or actually, in this one, it's two. So in this one, the, um, the, the isoforms are here in yellow and blue. One of the exons is unique to one of the isoforms and does not overlap any of the regions of the other isoform. You have all of these reads in gray, right? Some of which overlap, some of which cover them or don't. Right? And what you have to decide is, given the reads piling up on the regions that overlap um, and the reads that pile up on the region that's unique, you use the ones that are unique to figure out what fraction of all of the reads really belong to that isoform and not the other one. Right? So for instance, if they're equally expressed, right, you would expect these exons to be covered, you know, this exon to have roughly one half of the reads that should be going to that region, right? Okay? Um, and it basically creates a graph to figure out exactly, because you have the two paired ends, right? And that often helps you, gives you extra confidence in figuring out which one belongs here versus there, okay? Based on that insert size. So that's how that insert size is used again. Right, depending on whether if there's an exon in the middle, that will be farther apart or something, right, or, or closer. Um, and then it uses a, a log likelihood um, number, right? It's statistical inference as it goes back and forth. Like it, I'll initially divide them like this. I'll calculate whether or not that's the most likely method, or whether if I, you know, distribute them differently, um, I get a better estimate, right? Um, that's more likely. And it'll use this to try and figure out wh where to split each of those reads and who to give them to. Right? So that's, that's the main thing that Cuffdiff spends most of its time on, is figuring out where to distribute those reads. Right? Because just counting reads that overlap genes is very, very fast and very, very simple. And you can do that with something like intersect bed. Right? But if you want to know how to distribute them between overlapping regions, <clears throat> then you have to use these iteration cycles. You have to use something a little more sophisticated. And that's what Cuffdiff is doing. Right? And it's for this reason that it, that it needs to calculate those abundances, even if you went through cufflinks already. Okay? Um, and it doesn't use any cufflinks numbers if you went through cufflinks and then go to cufdiff. Really, it doesn't. No, you would think that would save you time. You think you could yeah. tell it, I did cufflinks already. Yeah. <laughs> use that info. No, it does not. I don't know. I didn't write it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I imagine this is quite complicated, and I'm wondering if yeah. cufdiff is somehow learning patterns in the data, like bias and in general, no. So in general, it's doing it de novo each time. And the reason is that we don't necessarily expect the distribution of reads between isoforms to be correlated for different genes, um, because it's usually just related to um, you know, whatever regulatory elements are driving that particular locus. Right? And that tends to be not correlated with other loci. Right? So it doesn't, um, it, it learns in general how many iterations it needs to do, and they did that the first time when they set it up, but other than that, it doesn't use information from one locus to uh, inform another one. Is it, but within the locus, is it looking at things like, you know, the density of reads at different regions of the gene that might not be due to transcript? Yes, there are, okay, so, OK, this is a tangent, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, there, are, um, there are different methods of library prep. One is called not-so-random hexamers. And what those are is basically um, randomized primers that are depleted for ribosomal RNA sequences. Um, this is a good way to be able to do ribosomal RNA depletion without having to do poly A selection or something like that. Right? Um, but it's very spiky. Those not-so-random hexamers um, include lots of hexamers that are actually in real genes. And so wherever you have that, you'll get you know, a spike up and then down and then up and then down. And it'll be really spiky across the transcript. That kind of data makes this cuff stiff jobs much harder, right? Because there's not an even coverage and then a drop where there's a non-shared exon and then back up to even coverage or something like that, right? Um, it still could be done, right? Yeah? What is the limit, upper limit, of uh, alternate exons that this program can detect and count? Okay. Assuming that they're all about equally expressed. Oh, that's even harder. So it's, it's, even it's, harder? it's okay. much harder if they're about equally yeah. expressed. Okay. If there's a okay. big yeah, difference, <laughs> <laughs> no, if there's a big difference, it's really easy to tell because you have even, even, even drop. Even, 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 right? And you can say, oh, hey, there's an expressed exon here, but it's not shared among them, and therefore I can really easily figure out what the contribution of that particular transcript is. 
based on, you know, it should be about that level across the rest of the gene. If they're really close to each other, it's, it's much harder, right? You just divide immediately and say, I don't know. I don't know which they came from, but it's probably even, right? Um, uh, the question that you're asking is something separate, which is how many isoforms before this whole thing breaks down and it doesn't do a good job because it can't converge, yes. right? Because what you need is you need the maximum likelihood iterator to be able to converge That's on a exactly single answer. Yes, exactly. And the answer is about 20. Okay. Right? So we've tried this before because we thought, hey, this is kind of like transposons. We could use this to try and figure out repeat elements and how to distribute reads between different repeat yeah. loci. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately yeah. not. There are very few repeats yeah. that are present at 20 copies or less. Um, and so in, in general, the, the, the iterator breaks down and it won't converge to a single answer. And that's when you, when it, yeah, when you can't use it. Exactly. So there, you know, maybe P53 has more isoforms than that, but most genes don't, right? Most genes are four or five, something like that. Yeah. So this may not, uh, I'm but for the design of the green line, if, let's say, in the undergraduate classroom, we aren't going to go and down to look at novel transcripts. Right now, the, the green line is set up so that you have to go through cup links before you can do cup two, correct? Mm -hmm. You could probably open that up. I think that would be really helpful, if, if just to save time and make it more feasible to have the students actually do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I know, it seems right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's a different thing to just open that up after, after you have your alignment. It, it, it would be nice to have the option for those who want to use the green line for reading science, yes. but um, it would be nice to have the option to skip a couple of things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Express reason on that. Yeah. So they say don't give out isoforms because it's plain useless. You just reduce it. You just do like bam to down so you can copy, right? It doesn't the full getting of this, it just overlaps the position there. Yeah, so a lot of yeah, so there's this HTC count or something like that that will do it. Um, the nice thing about HTC count is it will I think not include intronic reads. Right, because some people consider intronic reads to be contamination and that they shouldn't be counted towards the transcript itself. That's not necessarily always true because there's <laughs> often read through, especially of the first intron or something like that, right? And then there's also retained transcripts that are unspliced, all sorts of things that you might be interested in. Um, so depending on exactly how you want to do this, right, um, you can just count up reads that are consistent with the locus and skip all this isoform stuff. And in addition, if you don't care that CupDiff goes through doing this, it does give you gene level analysis. So um, I, I will get to that because I'll show you in the output that it has you know, separate gene level analysis, isoform level analysis, you know, exon level analysis. It's all in there. Um, okay, so a typical CupDiff command looks like this. And you know, again, I'm giving you the full thing. It's the command itself, the output file, and then all of the parameters you need to specify. Right? In general, um, the most important things to specify are how you're going to normalize the data. I think there was a question about that earlier. Um, the GTF file that you're going to be using, um, usually it prefers that you use its own CuffDiff generated one, but you know, any gen uh, GTF file that worked with Top Hat will also work with CuffDiff. Um, and, and the BAM files, which need to be grouped by genotype or condition or whatever you know, uh, 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 grouping you have. Right? So I have, for instance, here, mutant, mutant, wild type, wild type. Okay, but I assume in the green line they're going to they're going to format that for you. Uh, do they do this? They do they do this on a command line, or are there drop down boxes that they're specifying? It's drop down. Uh, I have to double check this option in particular. What for tip, for grouping? For a sample one sample two. Yeah, no, a sample one sample two, and you write the all the ones. So okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I assume. So you guys have access to our Galaxy, right? Because we already wrote an interface for Galaxy for how to use this. And I assume that it would probably be excellent for us to go you know, keep notes with each other yeah. on cool tricks you've learned, right? Um, OK, how to normalize the data. Um, the most common one that most people use is FPKM. Um, the reason that people like to use this, so this is frag fragments uh, counted per kilobase of effective uh, mappable exon length uh, per mapped million reads. Um, and the reason that this one is nice um, is that you can figure out, you know, it, does my FPKM correspond to your FPKM and therefore are we getting reasonably consistent numbers when we're looking at the same kinds of samples, so right? if you use the same GTF file, it should. If you use the same G, well, not if you have a different sample. <laughs> like if I made my own samples and you did your own samples, 
our FPKMs will roughly correspond, but they'll be off, right? You know, either by, yeah. Just the noise. Yeah, there's just going to be noise. There may or may not be, you know, like a, a whole shift up or something like that. And also, depending on how deep you went, it doesn't always linearly correlate, right? So if you go twice as deep, you're not necessarily going to, you know, yeah, you'll get twice the number of reads, but your art, you know, per max million reads normalization is not necessarily going to put you back at the same number, right? So you want generally to be about the same number. You want them to correlate, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, there, there are problems with FPKM, right? So you can imagine that if the most abundant transcripts in your sample are the ones that change by a lot, um, you could be getting 20 million reads to that transcript, right? Um, and all of the other transcripts in the other sample that don't have a transcript that is expressed that highly have more reads, right? Because you, you sequence 100 million reads no matter what in one lane, right? Okay, so when you're normalizing per map million reads like this, if you have a really abundant one that changes, you can actually make it look like everything else is less abundant in that sample because it sopped up reagents on the flow cell. Right? Um, so those are re reasons why some people have gotten away from doing FPKM normalization. Um, you can do things like um, uh, n what's called upper quartile normalization. So that's you take the, the transcripts that are in the upper quartile that are about the 75th most expressed um, and just normalize to what they look like. Because right? in general, you know, if, you, if you have an average of those or something like that, it might be better. Because um, uh, you, you expect most things to not change and you expect things within a given quartile not to change because you don't expect it to correlate with that, right? Um, the other one is geometric normalization. This is more common in a lot of the other um, uh, non cuff diff packages for gene expression. This is just, I think, what you were talking about, where you do the geometric mean of the reads across all libraries. So you make a sort of pseudo library that's the mean of what, um, of what each of the different libraries says. Right? And you say, OK, how many do I have compared to what the average of all of them has? Right? And that way, they should all uh, be normalized to each other really well. Right? But you won't they won't necessarily correspond to somebody else's numbers if they did it differently. Right? So that's the only problem with it and, and why it hasn't been widely accepted. But in general, it, it sometimes does a better job than FT FPKM does. Yeah. I just did you the review where they talk about immunization and RNA tip yeah. to RNA levels. Yeah. And they suggest normalization to DNA levels. Have you heard anything about that? Or? Yeah. So this, was a big, so this was a big paper about MYC a little while ago, right? So they were saying that basically MYC is a transcriptional amplifier that makes everything more abundant in the cells where that one is being highly expressed, right? And what that, if you normalize to expressing most genes not to change, you're now going to be wrong because, in fact, most genes are changed up a little bit in that particular situation. And so everything will be off by a little bit. There are basically two ways that you can uh, get around that. One is to do spike in controls. So you would spike in a given amount of a normal RNA that you don't expect to map to your samples, like Phi X or something like that, right? And you say, I know how much Phi X per cell number I put in there, right? And therefore, you know, this, that's going to be the normalization that I'm going to use, right, for how many of those mapped in that sample. Right? Um, the other one is normalizing to copy number, DNA copy number or something like that. Um, but that requires <coughs> doing DNA copy number estimates, right? So, <laughs> right? so I mean, it's, it's a problem. Just like pieces of leaves from corn, it's pretty difficult to figure out you know, how much exactly I get. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can, you know, maybe you can take some of the sample and do qPCR or something like that to figure it out, right, what the copy number per cell is. But I know it's, it's yeah, I mean, yeah, you basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Exa oh, yeah? So, so these are all post-run uh, normalization yeah. that you indicated here, but the yeah. spiking you have to, to be in advance. Yeah. Is that pretty routine if I went to the UW Genome Center and said, yeah, I'd like you to do this RNA seek, but I want you to spike it in advance so I can normalize it later? Are they going to be ready for that? Well, I mean, when you're doing your um, you give them the RNA usually, right? So you can just order up some RNA from Ambion, right? And you can just put it in there yourself and calculate how much you need to put in there given how many cells. <laughs> you don't need to tell them exactly. <laughs> you, you can sneak it in all on your own. <laughs> exactly. But, um, 
but yeah, no, I mean, it's a good thing to do, and we should be doing it. Most people have ignored it and just do relative full changes, right? Understanding that there is this caveat in the background. So it would be like, a, I mean, how many, FD, like if you got like a thousand FDK, what would be a thing that you saw that, you like, oh my God, this gene is so high that it could be like really. They're usually short. Right, so those are the, usually the things that are shorter on average than the other one, and so when you normalize per you know, KB yeah. or something like that, and it's like 0.5 or 0.2, then the FPKM goes through the roof. Oh, right, so yeah. snow so RNAs do this. So you see something that's just like, 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 a, like a tenfold more than anything else, and you know you have it. Exactly, exactly, mm -hmm. right. So yeah, so if it's not like a housekeeping gene that you expect to be abundant, mm -hmm. right, and it's not like a snow RNA, and yet it gets this huge FPKM, mm -hmm. that's cool. Right, um, but yeah, but in general, it, it previously when we've done this, when we've sorted by the most abundant things that changed because we were interested in them, it was snow RNAs or something, right? <laughs> yeah, they are interesting. They are interesting. They weren't. They weren't the transcription factor we were going after. They're not transcriptional. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, other options. What else might you want to change um, that would be really useful? Um, you can specify the minimum number of reads per gene below which you don't do the statistics. This one is kind of important. If you have fewer than 10 reads on a gene, your statistics are basically meaningless, right? right? Um, just from small number fluctuations. Um, people set this, the default is 10. Um, people, 20 is a little bit more common. People go as high as 100 before they'll even look at the statistics. You'll still get an abundance output in your, but it'll just say no test. It won't do the statistical test for differential expression um, for you um, if it's below this number that you set, okay? What's the difference between no test and low data? I think that's when um, you set it low, but CuffDiff decided it's not gonna do it anyway, right? <laughs> right, yeah, I mean, yeah. Was that per sample or? It's, av uh, it's usually per sample, right? Because, uh, it, I mean, you can, uh, I would have to double check that. I think Cuffdiff is saying per sample, right? Um, so, so that at least one of them has at least that many reads. Like if the other one is oh, all okay. zeros and one has an av you know, 10 or something like that, I think as it's long okay. As one of them has at least 10. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Because you'd be That's really sad if you got rid of all of the things yeah, that are zero that are huge in the other one. The other one is 25. That's interesting, maybe, yeah, exactly. Um, oh, you can specify a mask file of transcripts for anything that shouldn't be removed from the analysis. This can be snow RNAs. If you don't find them interesting, this can be, our RNAs is much more common, right? So especially, you know, ribosomal depletion only really works well for human and mouse because they only really made those, uh, those uh, beads conjugated to human mouse RNAs, right? Um, for others, um, you might want to take out the RNA before you do any kind of abundance estimation and normalization. Um, because that is a contaminant, and the amount that you get doesn't correlate with um, the rest of the RNA levels, right? Um, you can tell it to take any multi-mapper reads and try to infer the true locus. So this is what's called rescue mapping, and it's very similar to the same iteration loop that it did for isoforms. It's again going to try and you know uh, figure out um, how many reads map to that repeat locus along with it, and then figure out whether or not it belongs over here with those or uh, on this other place that it's mapping to that has you know no reads in, uh, around except for that one or something. Right, so this is, this is for, for multi-mappers again. Um, you can tell it to label the output file, so instead of just saying sample one, sample two, it says mutant wild type or whatever. I assume that's part of the things that you guys set. Um, and again, you can tell it to use multiple threads to go faster. Um, oh, and dispersion method. This one is actually important um, and uh, a little bit harder to explain. So we're gonna go into the stats of how differential expression is actually done so that I can explain to you what these dispersions mean and how to choose them. Okay, so a little detour, this is like four slides or something like that to explain statistical distributions, okay? Um, everybody is familiar with Gaussian or normal distributions because they're nice, they're easy, right? Um, they describe a, smoo a smooth distribution, right? Um, so for instance, if you gave your toddler yogurt, you're gonna have a smooth distribution that may be centered around their mouth, but not necessarily, okay? <laughs> this, this works well for microarrays. Microarray data does beautifully with a simple Gaussian distribution, okay? And this underlies the t-test. So the t-test is a parametric test, meaning you specify the distribution, underlying distribution, in which in this case is a Gaussian, 
okay? Um, and in this case, the dispersion is very well known. The dispersion is just the amount of spread, right? And in this case, the dispersion is the standard deviation. So standard deviation is one way of measuring dispersion, but it's specific to the distribution that you're using. For a Gaussian distribution, standard deviation is a good measure of dispersion. For other distributions, it's not. Okay, um, and you completely specify this dis distribution by just setting the mean and the standard deviation, and then the rest of it—that's the—that's the distribution you get. Okay, um, for non-smooth distributions that are otherwise random, what we're talking about is we're talking about a Poissonian distribution. So this would be if you gave your toddler spaghetti noodles instead of yogurt, right? It's going to be clumpy, and you know, depending on the area that you choose, you might have you know three or none. Right? You're not going to have two and a half pieces of spaghetti in that region. Okay? This, um, this has been used for a long, thing, long time to describe things like stars in the sky. That's another distribution where you expect it to be binary, yes or no. It's in there or it's not. And it's quantile. It's not going to be a smooth uh, 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 distribution of them. For very large numbers, a Gaussian and a Poissonian distribution look exactly the same. Right? So you can imagine that if the sky was completely covered in scar stars, it would look like a smooth distribution. Right? And that relates back to reads, because if your data is deep enough that you're essentially covering the whole genome with reads, or if it's noisy enough that you're covering the whole genome with reads, this is essentially a Gaussian distribution, and you can use t-tests again. But for most cases, for us, we don't have infinite data, even at 100 million reads. It's very uh, uh, spiky in its distribution. It's very clumped around the transcripts and not so much in the rest of the genome, which are 95 percent, essentially, right? Um, and it's going to look somewhat Poissonian. Not exactly. So the Poissonian was because it was statistically describing the situation we have, which is I had take this many reads, throw it at the genome, what's the likelihood they pile up on a transcript, right? That's the random null hypothesis we're testing against. Um, then it looked like a Poissonian distribution. And this di distribution is completely specified by the mean. This, the way that a Poissonian distribution um, is specified is that the mean and the dispersion are equal to each other, right? But that covers only statistical fluctuations. So if it were completely random, if there were no biological variation involved, and in particular for technical replicates, a Poissonian distribution does a very good job of describing them. So the first replicates that were run for RNA-seq data were run with technical replicates. Poissonian distributions fit very nicely, and people used that for a couple of years until they figured out that once you start having biological replicates, it does not work well at all, right? So for bi biological replicates, you need something called a negative binomial distribution. All this is is a Poissonian distribution that's over-dispersed, meaning it has more dispersion than you would expect from just statistical fluctuations. Okay? So you can imagine that we took that dispersion parameter right back here that, um, and we just allowed it to change. Right? So instead of the mean lambda, our dispersion is now lambda plus some number that describes the amount of biological variation that's going on in a negative binomial distribution. Okay, so this is just, oh, I should explain the charts. So this is, uh, these are all Poissonian distributions just with different means, right? And they all look very different from each other, which is not the case for Gaussian distributions, for instance, okay? Um, this is the difference between a Poissonian distribution and a negative binomial distribution with the same mean, okay? And you can see that there is more dispersion, that there's more spread in the negative binomial distribution than there is in the Poissonian distribution. Okay, so this is the standard of what's used. Cuffdiff uses negative binomial distributions. EDGAR, DEC, all of the differential expression uh, packages use a negative binomial distribution when they're doing differential expression, right? Okay, so how do we know this is the good one to use, right? So how do we know that a negative binomial does a better job than a Poissonian, right? Um, and the reason is that we can actually measure this. We can measure the mean, which is the average expression between different replicates of the same condition, and we can measure the variance, how much spread there is um, between those different replicates. And the purple line here is the Poissonian fit. And what you can see is that the scatter of points, they go above the purple line. They have more variation than can be explained by a Poissonian distribution. Okay? The orange lines here are the negative binomial fit line to that distribution. And one thing that you can see is they don't fit super well. Right? Like, even though we have this thing that we say is the distribution to use, there's still more scatter in the data.
than just from statistical. So here, right, the, um, there's more scatter at the low end right, as you would expect from these lowly abundant transcripts, but they follow the distribution itself. The, they, they go through both the Poissonian and the negative binomial in the low end. At the high end is where the transcripts all shift up to following the negative binomial fit and not the Poisson. So it turns out that the extra Poissonian variance that we see is often seen mostly in the high abundance transcripts. So, and, and the reason that I'm specifically pointing that out is a lot of people think, well, you know, I know that my fit is not going to work super well, but it probably is going to do worse on the lowly expressed things that I don't care about anyway, so I might as well just use the one that's easier. But that's actually not true. It's actually the more abundant ones that, you're, that most people tend to be particularly interested in that are particularly better well fit by this negative binomial distribution. So it does actually really matter which one you use, okay? Um, okay, so dispersion method. So how are we going to specify that dispersion? Because the difference between a Poissonian where the dispersion is just the mean and a negative binomial where we specify the disp dispersion is that we measure the dispersion from the data. We empirically fit it, right? We measure what the variance is as a function of the mean and we use that to specify what the expected per gene variance should be. Right, because we take a gene, we figure out what its mean expression level is, and then we use a fit like this to figure out what we expect the variance to be. And then we're going to ask, is the differential expression between the two samples more than the expected variance that you would expect if these were all actually from the same sample, right? And that's the null hypothesis that we're testing against when we test for statistical confidence that there's differential expression, right? Is that it's much more likely that these came from two dis different dis uh, distributions with different variants than that they all came from the same one and were just scattered, okay? All right, so, uh, I yeah. I have a question. I, I kind of lost something you said. So, um, so you were saying it was a better fit for the high abundance than the low abundance. Um, and the negative binomial is a better fit than the plus on to that. So, so, so actually my question is, what I didn't catch was, is the negative binomial fit still a weak fit for something? That's the, okay. are, are there times where I should be concerned about how accurate these stats are using this fit, is what I'm asking. I would put it this way. You can get a better fit to your data but the danger is in overfitting to your data so that you're just following trends in your data that are not the general trend that you would expect um, uh, from any data set, right? So the danger is in using a different null hypothesis each time you do this such that you can't cross compare results you get from different experiments. Right? Okay. Because if you overfit to your right. data, you can get a perfect fit. You can follow every little right. thing and get a right. perfect fit. But if you do that for each data set, you can't cross compare the results. Actually, let me rephrase my question a little okay. bit. It's clear, looking at this, that yeah. the negative binomial fit is better than a Poisson. Yeah. And that seemed to be a true across data sets for RNA seq. Yeah. Um, is it possible or likely that there could be another fit that we just haven't, statisticians haven't found yet? Sure. <laughs> and what, so what, what would it be correcting? It would be, well, so, I mean, so there's a couple things that you, okay. Um, are there things, how are much there of a tangent to go up on for this one? Are there things that are typically weak points with the negative binomial fit? If you looked at this, you would say, oh, the high abundance is a weak area for the Poisson. Yeah, exactly. So I would say that for every distribution, the low abundance regime is going to be a weak point, right? Okay. We are just bad at calling things in the low abundance regime. Okay, and that makes sense because there's not very much there. Yeah, exactly. So and it's just going to scatter to around, okay. right? There are, there are people who try and figure out if there is another variable in their data set that explains more of the variance. They use something called a general linearized model, right? And they say, for instance, okay, these samples are from healthy people, these samples are from people with a disease, but the people with the disease are also older on average than my healthy subjects. And so I'm going to use that as an extra variable to try and fit for the difference that's ab over and above what age tells you versus what the disease state is telling you, right? It would be fabulous, for instance, if you could have two pop you know, a scatter of populations of older and younger normal patients so that you could specifically fit that variable and remove it from the analysis, right? So GLM models, they're generally not, not using negative binomial models. They're just using, uh, they're just using a, 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 um, 
linear combination of different negative binomials, one that fits to the data given the age and one that fits to the data given the disease state, right? Yeah. yeah, so in general, I only do it if there is a secondary variable that I can describe well, right? So for instance, if I have breast cancer data and I have four different types of breast cancer within my samples, and I want to understand, you know, what's particular cancer versus normal, but what's also separately different HER2 versus normal that's not different, you know, um, triple negative versus normal or something like that. Right, so these are variables that are very well defined that you can group the categories into. And in general, you need multiple replicates per category in order to do a good job of doing that, right? But if, for instance, you had 50 samples, half of them were older, half of them were younger, you know, that would be a good situation in which you could use GLM models to try and understand some of the variance that's in your data set. Okay. All right, so even once you've decided that you're going to use a negative binomial method, there are different ways of measuring the dispersion, right? Okay, and, and what I say is, I, I mean different ways of aggregate, aggregating it for the gene, right? So when you, pooled is the default. That means that you measure, so for instance, if you have three replicates of the wild type, right, you have one, two, three different measurements for what the variance is, right, for that gene, and you can sort of pull that to figure out what the average variance is or what you expect, so it's not overfit to one of the samples versus another, right? Um, per condition means that you think that the variance is different in one sample type than in a different sample type. Like, for instance, you think all the normals are pretty well correlated together, right? They sit like this, and the, you know, the, the disease samples are like this. Right? And you want to say, I want to know, even though the, the variance is very different between these two, can I still get a better idea that these are different from those, right? You know, even though their error bars overlap by a lot, right? Because I expect the variance to be different in those two conditions, right? In general, you need a lot of samples in order to do a good job of per condition measurements of the variance um, because you saw how scattered the data was on the other plot, right? So they recommend like five, five replicates per condition to do a good job. Yeah, uh, stat statisticians will always want more data than you necessarily can afford to get. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, blind means that you completely ignore sample type and act like all samples are replicates of each other. You only do this if you don't have replicates. Like let's say for instance, you have five normal replicates, you have three for another condition, and then for another condition, two of the libraries failed and you only have one left, but you still wanna see if you can do it. Right? Or maybe you only have you know, one replicate each because you just want to see if there's a difference and if there is, you'll go get lots more replicates and, and do a real job of this. Right? So people will often do blind for those reasons, but otherwise I would not recommend it. Um, Poisson means you're fitting to a Poisson distribution and not measuring variance. I don't know why you would do this, but it's an option. <laughs> right? Just no? Uh, okay, so those are the different dispersion methods, right? Okay, so you've got your dispersion method, you've got all your other parameters set, now you're going to have output files, right? Okay, and the, there's a ton of them, right? There's, there's like eight or 10 output files that are in the output directory for a typical cuff diff run. Um, most people look at these two, right? So gene expression.diff and isoform expression.diff give you abundances, full changes, and p-values. Um, for at the gene level analysis and also at the isoform level. And that, that's most of what most people are interested in. There is a ton of other stuff in there. They try and go after, you know, whether alternate transcription start sites are being used. Um, they try and go after whether or not particular different proteins are being produced when there's a splice isoform, because sometimes yes, sometimes no, depending on where that uh, exon is. Um, there are all of these tracking files that have lots of information about the number of reads per replicate. So for instance, if you wanted to make sure that some novel transcript you're calling has enough reads to be called and that, you know, it's pretty even between the different replicates, it's not like one spike of contaminants in one of them, you might go looking into these files, but in general, most people don't. And it's up to you whether or not you're interested in them. Um, that is your output. Um, one last note on p-values. 
um, the p-values need to, need to be adjusted. Um, and statisticians have been harping for a long time on this idea called p-value phishing, which is basically that if you run a test over and over, eventually by random chance, you're going to get a significant p-value, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we want to correct so for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, we, but we're all probably interested in that because we all probably want to get those uh, 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 false discovery rates uh, out of our data sets, right? Um, so you can adjust your p-values one way. The most common way that's done is called the Benjamini and Hochberg method. You basically rank all your genes by p-value, large to small, and then you adjust by the number of genes that have a p-value smaller than that. What that does is it guarantees that only 5% of your data should randomly get a p-value less than 0.05, which is what that's supposed to represent, right? Um, uh, and so the, the actual calculation looks like this. Usually it's done automatically for you in CuffDiff. There are a couple other prog uh, programs that will do it for you too. Um, but it is important to use the adjusted p-values because um, otherwise you'll get 10,000 genes coming up as significant well, you know, in a like, list of 16,000. I say theoretically, your technical references yeah. theoretically was no different. Would it still yeah. find 5% that are different? Probably. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Because I like using FDR and I know it's like it's not on the output or... So Q FDR and Q-value are essentially the same thing. So Q-value is a way of controlling the FDR and whether a particular software package labels that as FDR or labels it as Q-value or labels it as adjusted P-value, no. it's the same thing. Okay. The only thing that differs is what method they use. So they might use Bonferroni or Benjamini and Hochberg or one of the other methods. Benjamini and Hochberg, uh, which is often abbreviated BH, is the most common. Okay, so what do we do? We typically do a little bit of QC to make sure that our analysis went well and that our data looks good, and then a lot of downstream analysis, which completely d uh, differs depending on what you want to do with it, right? Um, usually, I like to look at the replicate correlation plots, right? So these, this is one set of replicates for one condition. This is another set of re replicates for another condition. In general, you want to see better than 90% correlation between them. This is 99% correlation uh, between the replicates. Right? Um, this is um, actually sample versus sample correlation, and they're pretty well correlated. Not that much changes. And in particular, that's because for these samples, they have the same genotype. They were just selected for a different phenotypic behavior. Okay? And we were looking for the particular genes that track that phenotype uh, 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 and, and understanding that there was no genotypic difference between them. Right? Um, you'll get more scatter in general if you're using mutant versus wild type, one you know, developmental stage versus another, something like that. Okay, um, the next thing that we use is we usually do some kind of principal components analysis. So multiple dimensional scaling is another one that's really common. They essentially do the same thing. They're, what they're asking you is they're making a plot where they're saying what amount of variance explains most of the difference between these samples and is there a single way that I can separate them based on that, right? Okay, and so in this case, it did a really good job, right? So dimension one actually separates the, um, whether or not the lines were resistant to a drug or not resistant to a drug, right? And the other dimension actually separates whether or not they're grown in that drug or not grown in that drug, regardless of whether they're resistant to it, right? So the two first principal components actually separated based on the phenotypes that we had specified for those samples. So that was really nice. You won't always get that kind of separation between them, and often you'll get samples over here where they're fairly close to each other, and that's usually because they're pretty related, right? Sometimes you'll get more scatter, but you should see, it doesn't really matter where they are on this plot, right? The specific numbers on the axis don't matter as much as whether or not they're separated from each other, and that's all you're really looking for, right, is that these separate from each other. They don't even have to separate along the axis. They can separate like this and it's still okay, right? So that's all you're looking for is that they occupy different areas of the graph, right? Um, and this is the heat map that corresponds to um, the genes that particularly separate these two conditions uh, for my data set, right? Um, this is, the PCA plots are done with all genes. The heat maps, usually you can only really see anything um, if you're using about 2,000 genes or fewer. If you try to send every gene in the genome to a heat map, you usually really don't see anything at all. Right, so we separated on ones that were statistically significantly different, right? And this is about maybe 1,500 genes or something like that, okay? Um, the next thing that people do is pathways analysis. Um, this particular is what it looks like if you have a screen when you're doing ingenuity or something like that. Ingenuity is sort of the very, very basic um, Venn diagram type overlap. I have a list of genes that are different. I have a list of genes in a pathway. Is the overlap area significant? 
right? That's the most basic analysis you can do. As you can imagine, um, there are better ways of doing it, right? Um, one way is gene set enrichment analysis, where they rank the genes by expression value, and they say, do most of the genes in my gene set cluster on one end or the other? Meaning, are most of them going up versus most of them going down? Right, and you know, you, it might be important to you that you know most of the things in the p53 pathway are going down, rather than random genes in that pathway are going up and down, but they have no relationship to each other. Right, so that's sort of the second level way of doing gene set enrichment analysis. Um, and this is my lab, and that's it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> open source. So you can take it, you can adjust it, you can use it, you can do whatever you want with it. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. Get <laughs> out. No. Um, there, there is a list of gene ontologies assigned to the maze genes. You can get them, and you can use David. So you can, you can, um, maze GDB somewhere, right? So somewhere in the maze GDB, there is something called. It's made by Mapman. Right, so Mapman is this program that assigned gene ontology for the maize genes based on orthologs in Arabidopsis, and then a few oh, yeah. that are adjusted. Yeah, yeah. So it's not perfect, yeah, right? That. Yeah, I have that one. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. There, okay. Yeah, I mean, maize is just going to be hard for a while, right? Yeah. I mean, the genome itself is still kind of put together with duct tape, essentially, right? But. <laughs> <laughs> Probably millions. <laughs> 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 so let's please thank Molly so much for coming. <laughs>